So I was taking a look at the crowd really quickly. I was like, man, the, the pastor leaves and everybody leaves. <laughs> and then I was like, you guys filled up the crowd pretty nicely, so that's good. Um, we're already having technical difficult difficulties. Of course we are. All right, we're good. <laughs> so our pastor and their family on vacation uh, this week. And so Sonny actually uh, asked me to preach the next two weeks. And so I got a small two-part sermon series for you guys. Hopefully it's going to be something cool. Uh, I don't know. Uh, when, when I was beginning to ask God about like what to bring me to, 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 to speak to you guys, to, to preach, he, uh, he decided to bring me to current events. Okay, And I know some of you might be thinking, thinking that, Okay, he brought you to the election. Yeah, the election is important. It's pretty current. I'm sure there's a lot of sermons that could go on about that. Um, but he didn't. Um, I'm actually a 24-year-old guy who grew up playing video games. And so um, he brought me to Pokemon. <laughs> okay, some of you guys are like, Pokemon is the stupidest thing ever. But if you've heard of it, Pokemon is basically, it started off as a card game and then turned into a video game back in the 90s, and so around 2000, I started playing it. And basically, you're a trainer, and you catch these pocket monsters, which is why you have the shortened Pokemon, okay? And then eventually, you'll train them to battle other Pokemon, okay? I, I see a lot of your faces. Stick with me here. I got some good for you guys, okay? So Pokemon, it's pretty relevant right now, and because... There's this app developer for, sm for smartphones called Niantic Labs who created a game called Pokemon Go, okay? And it came out in the beginning of July, and in July, it just boomed. <laughs> so I have three pictures up here. Basically, it uses your smartphone's GPS, okay? And it actually gets your actual location, and you're a trainer. And so there you see actual roads I didn't take a screenshot of like Reedsburg or anything, but you'll see actual roads and actual map of the place that you are. And basically you're hunting Pokemon in that specific area. And they'll just show up randomly, kind of like uh, on the right side there, see that Squirtle. Everybody say Squirtle. Squirtle. Okay. Squirtle's over there and you basically click on him and then you catch him. Okay. And then eventually, and when you try to catch him, he shows up like that. Um, and basically you just catch all these guys and you train them and then you battle other people, okay? Very interesting. I think it's a lot of fun. And so really, I wanted to hit you with some statistics about this game, okay? Pokemon Go statistics. All right, so the first one is, within 13 hours, the game became the top grossing application in the United States. Within 13 hours. That's crazy. And so what that basically means is that every single app within that 13-hour period was not being downloaded as much as Pokemon Go. Okay, think about the nostalgia here. You have a bunch of people my age who played it on video games, and now you can actually go and do it in the real world. There's a lot of people who downloaded it. Here's the next, next statistic. I can't speak today. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> The game has brought in $35 million in revenue, making $1.6 million a day. That's nuts. <laughs> That's absolutely crazy. Basically, $35 million since July when it rolled out, the beginning of July, and every single day it brings in $1.6 million. That's, that's both in stocks as well as people do, using microtransactions within the app. You can purchase certain things to get you farther ahead than other trainers. So that's another crazy statistic. But this is the one that I really want you guys to pay attention. It attracts 21 million users and has 4.5 million downloads a day. That's nuts. <laughs> that means 21 million active users throughout the world are playing this game. 21 million active users. They play it every day. They try to hunt for Pokemon and play with friends and everything like that. 21 million users. So I ask you this question. How can something so trivial have this many followers? 
Now, trivial, if you don't know the definition, it basically just means meaningless or unimportant. And to be honest, I, I love playing the game, but it really is unimportant. It really is trivial. It doesn't mean a whole lot. It's a lot of fun, but it doesn't mean a whole lot. But how come 21 million users are playing this game? Because a lot of you actually might be thinking, here's this 24-year-old guy doing a sermon on Pokemon. This is so dumb. Why are you doing this? Well, this is what God brought me to. And it's current events. 21 million people don't think this game is dumb. Don't think this game is trivial. Thinks this game means something. Let me hit you, let me hit you with another statistic. As of 2010, 2.2 billion people considered themselves to be Christians. 2.2 billion. Is it up there? Yeah. They consider themselves to be Christians, meaning they are Christ followers, meaning they are people that love the Bible, love to go to church, love to hang out with people who do that same thing. 22 billion people consider themselves Christians. And Christianity, in my mind, it's not trivial. It's something so much more meaningful, something so much more important in somebody's life. It's not meaningless whatsoever. You can ask a bunch of people in this room and they'll tell you the same thing. And so, I ask you this. If a smartphone app can get 21 million users to get off their couch and go into the world... Why doesn't the most meaningful thing in the world get us going? Why doesn't the most meaningful thing in the world get us going and off the couch? Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are perfectly content with sitting around and not fulfilling what God has called them to do. They're perfectly content with that. They're perfectly content with sitting on the couch, not doing anything that the Bible says. And honestly, some people are perfectly content just living a lifestyle that's not according to God's, God's plan, even though they call themselves Christians. So I want to read what God has called us to do. I want to read that with you. And so if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew 28. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about a new game that's more important that I want you guys to play. It's called Discipleship Go. Okay? And not that, that's, not that it's a game. It's very important. But this is, this is what I want you guys to do. Let's read this. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that we must actually go. Right there. He says it. Therefore go. We have to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. And nations here just basically means people groups. Okay? Just means people that you see, you're supposed to make disciples of them. And this is a calling that Jesus has told us to do. First, I want to explore this word go. Okay? This word go. Just to make sure that we're not making any excuses. Just to make sure. So the, so the word go, it's a verb, means to take a certain course, or follow a certain procedure, according to Merriam-Webster, okay? So I, I hold Merriam-Webster to be the highest authority in dictionary. <laughs> so the word go, that's what that means. And I would say that that fits the biblical word here. That does fit, because if you think about it, Jesus has given us a grand call, and we are to make other disciples, and we need to follow that command. So he gave us that command, let's follow that procedure, let's do that certain course. Let's go. I decided to go one step further and see what the Greek word actually is for go here. All right, everybody's going to try to say it with me. It's tough to pronounce. <laughs> it's called peruome. Everybody say it. Peruome. All right, that means go. And here we got two definitions for it. It says to lead over, carry over, or transfer. The other definition is to pursue the journey on which one has entered, to continue one's journey. 
Th this is crazy. And so here's what I get from this definition of go. Here's what I get. We are continuing the journey that Christ started. Christ is literally transferring his ministry to us, to the local church, to individual believers within that local church. We are to go and make disciples. Think about the Gospels. That's exactly what Jesus did. We're going to read about that in a little bit. He is literally transferring the ministry he did on earth to us so that we can go and do it ourselves. That's awesome. He is not going to leave us stranded. If you read down a little bit, it says that I will never leave you nor forsake you, okay? In, in the same passage, verse 20, it says I'll never leave you. So he's never going to leave us stranded. When we actually do this going part, he's there with us. And that's awesome. That's a great promise. Listen, guys, we are to continue the work of Christ. We're conti to continue what he did on this earth. I want you to think of the Olympics. Okay, Olympics, current event right now. We're doing a bunch of current events here. Okay, so Olympics, really fun, right? Fun to watch. Last night I was watching a race, and this guy from Great Britain fell. He got tripped, and he still won the gold. It was crazy. How do you do that? <laughs> He's nuts. Okay. But anyway, plus it's 10,000 meters. Why would you run that? <laughs> Any, anyway, that's, that's crazy. Anyway, the Olympics, you have relays. You have individual medleys. You have team medleys in, in swimming. And basically, it's as if you're, it's as, it's as, if, as if Christ, I told you I know how to speak. It's just a little tough this morning. It's as if Christ is passing the baton to us. Okay, imagine you have a baton like the Olympics. It's a race. But he's handing it off to us. He's transferring that. And we have two things that we could do with that baton. We can just stop and let other teams win the race. Think about it. Or we can continue going, building upon it, building upon it with Christ's strength behind us. I think we should build upon it. I think as Christ empowers us to share the gospel, we should continue to do it. We are not just to sit around and forget our true calling. And I, want, I, I put a side note here in my notes, and uh, this is what Sonny calls freebies, so you guys can have this one. Okay. If you ever say that you don't know what God is calling you to do, you don't read your Bible. You don't read your Bible. Think about that. You have just heard from the scriptures what you're supposed to do. And if you think that you don't have a calling, you're wrong. <laughs> you got you to gotta do what the scriptures has told you to do. Listen, a lot of times people make the excuse that I don't know the specific plan that God has put out for me. Well, maybe, maybe you just have to do what he had already placed in, placed for you, and then he'll show you a specific, more specific path. Maybe just do what the scriptures say, and then he'll be like, here's your path. I think that's awesome. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think people should say that, because the scriptures clearly say that we have some things to do. You know, and maybe you're at a dead-end job right now, or maybe, maybe you're just in a position that you just don't see anything going forward, but yet... God has called you to something. God has told you to do something. Do it within the moment, and then he'll show you some specifics. He'll throw you some nuggets on, on what's going on in your life. I think we have a God that promises that, and he, he always sticks to that promise. So we are without excuse. We must continue to the work of Christ as he uses us for his glory. But let's take a look at the word disciple. Because that's what we're making, right? That's what this calling is for. We are to make disciples. And so the word disciple, another Greek word, we're going to say it together, okay? I have it written out uh, phonetically, so I know how to say it. It's mathateu, okay? Everybody say that with me. Mathateu. That's how you pronounce it. It's the word disciples, and it means to follow his precepts and instructions. To follow his precepts and instructions. So we are to go and tell people to follow Christ and share what Christ 
has told us so that they can listen to Christ and learn from him and do what he has taught. Another definition I saw was this. It's a more expounded definition. It says, helping someone to progressively learn the word of God to become a matured, growing Christ follower. That's an expanded definition on the Greek word. But think about it. That's an awesome definition because we are to help people grow and learn about Christ. We're supposed to help them grow to become better disciples, to become better character, to have more integrity. That's what we're supposed to be making. Notice that Christ just doesn't say believers. He says, go and make disciples, people who want to learn about God, people who want to be in that faith, actually who want to be there. So here's the two things that I got from this word alone. We are to make them followers of Christ. We have, to, we have to first get that initial thing happening. We need to make sure that they believe in Christ and so, and so they uh, can actually do the next steps of being a disciple. And so I want to read this. It says, So faith comes from hearing, that is, that is hearing the good news about Christ. Remember, we're not doing the making of them followers. We're not making them disciples. God is always doing the saving, but God is actually using us to help them get to God. Does that make sense? We still have a role in this. God does all the saving. Let's be honest. We can't, we can't do any saving. But we still have a role. He uses us to actually share the gospel. And Romans ten seventeen says, they can't have faith in God unless they hear it. We got to share the good news. We got to bring them the Bible. We got to bring them what Jesus taught us. Here's the second thing I learned. We are to help them to progressively learn the word of God to become mature in Christ. And here's, here's why I want to highlight this. So many times I hear of people bringing people to Christ. I hear people say, oh, I helped this guy become saved earlier this week. I helped this guy become a follower of Christ. But they never talk about what comes afterwards. They never talk about that. Listen, guys, we're not supposed to leave these people who just gave their life to Christ high and dry. We're supposed to help them. We're supposed to say, hey, you've become a follower. Let me tell you what a follower is, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to live, how they're supposed to read their Bible, how they're supposed to pray. There's some new believers that don't know how to do that. You've been around the church for a long time. You know how to do that stuff. There's people who don't. And then they give, them, they give themselves to Christ. They, they say, Christ, I've sinned, and you gave, you gave your life for me so that I could follow you, and yet they don't know how to follow. We are supposed to help them progressively learn the word of God to become mature in Christ. Our great commission from God himself is not just to make believers. Otherwise, it would say that. God would say that. Go make believers. Instead, it is to make God-fearing, Bible-reading, prayer-seeking, disciple-making followers. Yeah. Is the true calling of the church and each individual person. Meaning, when somebody becomes a believer, we cannot give up on them because that's when they're the most susceptible. They don't have a good grounding in the word. They don't have a good grounding in the faith. So then when they come up against another faith, they might be swayed. And I'm not saying that we're to brainwash people. That's not what this is about. We believe that this is the best life possible. And so why would we want people going to another place? Going to another faith? We cannot just give up on them. Paul would say, by no means. If you read the book of Romans, he asks you rhetorical questions, and then he yells, by no means. So the rhetorical question here would be, should we help them believe and then not, and then not help them? By no means. That's not our calling. Remember, it would say believers if, <laughs> if Jesus wanted it to. Think about a child. 
Think about a child. They are never going to learn anything if parents, and then eventually when they get to school, teachers actually teach them something and actually help them learn, help them grow. They're never going to become an adult unless you have those role models in their life. And the Bible actually uses that analogy a lot. You must have a childlike faith in order to become a believer, but then you should move past the elementary doctrines of the faith and go deep into theology. Peter, Peter talks about that. Hebrews talks about that. We have a childlike faith initially, but then we are to grow and mature in Christ. And so, just to kind of let you in on the series as a whole, today we're going to be kind of focusing on making followers, that initial belief. And then next week we're talking about how a disciple will look, how a disciple is supposed to be, how they're supposed to act, how how they're supposed to grow. But today I want you to see the full aspect in action. And so, turn turn forward actually, you're in Matthew, just turn one page to Mark chapter 1. We'll read verse 16. So it says, One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. And so here, Jesus was doing the go part. Jesus was actually doing the go part here. Do you see it? It says Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Now, I do believe that even though in Jesus' perfect power, he could have been sitting in a chair and asked them to follow them. But no, Jesus decided to walk, to meet them where they're at. He went to people and asked if they would follow. He actually went to the people. I want you to think about this. Let me ask you a question. How many of you use Facebook? How many of you use Facebook? There's a lot of hands up here, okay? A lot of people use Facebook. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you post about God on Facebook or maybe post a Bible verse? Okay, yeah, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of us who do that. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you stopping that because the Lord knows that Facebook is full of a lot of negative things. I don't want you to use that because I, I don't want you to stop that because I believe that God can actually use that. The issue here is this. Have you noticed that whenever you post about God or you post a Bible verse, the only people who like it are Christians that you know? Have you ever noticed that? Every time I post about God, it's only like Sonny or Liz or my wife just just liking it. And that's good and all. That's great. But think about this. Some people who aren't Christians might actually take a glance at that status, and then scroll past. And you would never know they saw it. You would never know they saw it. This is why the gospel needs to be shared personally. Keep keep sharing on Facebook. That's great. Because Facebook honestly has some bad stuff on it. And I'm sure all you Facebook users would agree. Keep doing that stuff. But on the same token, you can't just do that stuff. You have to actually go and meet these people. You have to talk to them. You have to be in relationship with them to actually share the gospel with them. Because honestly, I post all the time on Facebook about God. But I know my best friend Randy, who's in Illinois and doesn't know God, just scrolls past that. Scrolls past that. Because a lot of people just see the word God and they're automatically disinterested. The gospel is a personal thing, guys. So first, you have to know it personally. You have to know it. You can't share what you don't know. And then you actually have to go to the people. Go to people who are struggling. Second, from the same verse, Jesus saw people for who they were. Jesus saw people for who they were. Jesus saw Simon, who is actually Peter, okay? Everybody knows Peter, and his brother Andrew doing what they do best, fishing. Fishing. And so I want you guys, I wanted to highlight this. 
Because I want you to understand something. Sometimes, in order to share the gospel, you might have to go to places that you don't know or that you're not comfortable with or not familiar with. Now, let me tell you, Jesus knew a lot about fishing. If you read the version of this in the Gospel of Luke, he caught a lot of fish. (laughs) I mean, Peter and everybody else helped bring the fish in, but Jesus provided the fish. He knows a lot about fishing. (laughs) But listen to this. Jesus met those people, though, where they were at, while they were doing their profession. You know, I was... um, uh, a family recently um, that just uh, came, talk, came and talked to me about uh, their, their life and um, kind of seeking a little bit of counsel because they knew I was a Bible major. They knew I was kind of growing to, to, to become a pastor. And uh, it was, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, they, they have a son and they can't really relate to him and it's causing a lot of dissension in the family. And uh, honestly, I, I hate to bring the sermon back to video games, but um, it's because the kid, kid plays video games and they can't, the, they can't really relate to him. Can't really relate to him and it's, it's really tough. It's really tough. Um, you know, sometimes you have to go to that unfamiliar place. Sometimes you have to go to relate to people. So, sometimes you have to, you have to take, take on a task that you don't like just so that the gospel can be shared. When I, when I think about this, I think of Paul and how he, he, wrote in the, he wrote in his letters. He said, to reach the Jews, I became a Jew. To reach the Greeks, I became a Greek. And that's not saying that he's like hypocritical or anything. He's just, he's just trying to relate to those people because a Greek does not relate to a Jew. No way. Not back in that day. You need to relate to people where they're at. That's sometimes the only way that you're going to reach people. Sometimes when you want to share the gospel, you might have to go places where you might not be so comfortable. Remember that the gospel is relational, first and foremost. It's personal and relational. You can't share the gospel without actually talking to people. It's relational. Let's read on. Mark 17 to 18. And I'm almost done. And you guys are probably like, dang, it's before 11. <laughs> but that's, that's just how it is sometimes. Let's read on. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Here's the next thing I got out of this passage. Jesus used simplicity. Simplicity. Okay? At this point, Christ did not go on about deep theology. He eventually does that with these disciples. But he used in simplicity. Instead, Christ just told them to follow him. That's all he said. And then, and then he added, I'll make you a fisher, fishers of men. And then later on, he taught about that fishers of men thing. Do you see how simple it was? Do you see how simple it was? Consider this. Have you at some points when sharing the gospel gone into things you really don't have to? I've done it. <laughs> I've done it all the time. And let me tell you, it's worse for me. I'm not, not trying to, like, you know, uh, put me down or anything. But I'm a Bible major. <laughs> I, we, we talk about a lot of unnecessary things sometimes <laughs> when you're just trying to make a point. And so when you're sharing the gospel, sometimes you just have to keep it simple. Sometimes you just have to keep it simple. I have done it, and unfortunately, at the end, it's just not pretty. (laughs) It's just not pretty. God doesn't need the best theologians or Bible scholars to share the gospel. He wants you. He wants you. And you're saying, Mike, I am a Bible scholar. (laughs) Well, that's great. (laughs) But he could use anybody. He wants anybody to share the gospel. And you don't have to use big words or fancy theology. You don't have to. Sometimes people just need to hear God loves you. Honestly, that's what I learned from VBS this past week. I mean, there was, there was, every day there was, there was a, a saying, you know, Jesus knows my worth. Jesus knows my purpose. Jesus loves me and accepts me. You see how simple those are? And I'm sure seeds were planted in those kids. 
I guarantee seeds were planted because God does not let seeds go away. (laughs) God does not let seeds just blow by. He promises us that he'll be behind those seeds with his power. But we did it with such simplicity. All you guys who helped out with VBS, all you had to say to those kids was, Jesus loves you. And Jesus cares for you. I, I had, we had a kid in lessons. It was the, it was the first class. Um, and <laughs> this kid was so funny. His name was Isaac. <laughs> and we started talking about eternal life. And then we told him what it was. But we told him simply. It was like, you could live forever. He's like, I want that. <laughs> He's like, I want that. And then, he, and then he went on a rant about lifeguards and that just <laughs> didn't even go with the lesson. <laughs> and then we were talking about the spirit and he was like the spirit of Christmas. He was, he was, a, he was an awesome kid. I loved that kid. He was, he was so funny. But, but, that's, but that's sometimes what it takes. All you have to say is, hey, dude, you're going to live forever, man. I want that. I'm telling you, a seed was planted in that kid. He might, that, that seed might not come to fruition for a long time, but, but he knows it. And honestly, I want to thank, I, wanna thank, I, I mean, I didn't, run, I didn't run BBS, Lisa did, and I'm sure I'm saying the exact words she would say, thank you to all who volunteered. Because honestly, those, some of, sometimes kids, so, like this, this week kind of like rejuvenated my calling towards like youth ministry and just like, working with kids. And honestly, sometimes these kids just need to know that you know their name and that you love them. You know? And, and that, that's, that's the gospel. That is the gospel truth. Let me read this again. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Don't think you always have to bring a lecture. I know I'm lecturing to you now, kind of. <laughs> but when you're sharing the gospel, don't think you need to bring a lecture. All right, one more point, and I'll let you guys go. Jesus wants disciples. Jesus wants disciples. He doesn't want followers. He wants actual disciples. Notice that Jesus said, you will be fishers of men. I am a firm believer that you cannot be a fisher of men if you are not a disciple. I am a firm believer in that. Because Jesus understands the principle of multiplication. He understands that. Because the saying is completely true. I guarantee you've heard this before. Disciples make disciples. Disciples make disciples. And you know what, uh, Karen Karen and Roe, I'm putting a plug in for life group here. So if you're not signed up for life group, that's where discipleship making happens. That's where, that's where things happen. That's when you get down to the nitty gritty of your life and you realize that you need a savior. That's how discipleship happens. So please, plug into a life group if you're not. They're fantastic. I'm, I'm, I think I'm co-leading with James and Lisa this year and Heather and it, it's just going to be a blast. It's just going to be a blast. Disciples make Disciples. Now, we'll go into this more next week, more in depth. We'll talk about what, who disciples are, what disciples do. <laughs> we'll talk about that. But when you dive deep into God's word and deep into a prayer life with him, the easier it is to share the gospel, the easier it is to make disciples, and the easier it is to help people come to know Christ. It gets so much easier when you actually know what the word says and when you actually spend some time with God. Making disciples is easy. It's a a weighty task, but it is easy when you have God behind you. God's there. He promised in Matthew 28 that he's never going to leave us. He, He ascended and gave us his Holy Spirit to live within us, to indwell us, to give us help. Because I've said this so many times. We suck at life. <laughs> we are terrible at life. But we, we have a God who lives within us, who helps us. So here's the two things I want you to remember. <clears throat> Jesus did not say, go and make believers. He said, go and make disciples. And the second thing is, you cannot leave those disciples hanging because they need your help. 
Because like I said, some of them don't even know how to pray. Some of them don't even know how to read their Bible. And you guys do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much just for your awesome and awesome, awesome and mighty word. Lord, it says in Ephesians that our, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And it helps us, helps us live life knowing that you're behind us, knowing that you walk with us, knowing that you care for us. But Lord, I just pray that everybody, everybody here understands that our great calling is to make disciples, not just believers. It's to make people who are God-fearing, prayer-fervent disciples. And that they read the word of God and that they grow in you and that they love you more and more each and every day. God, you have called us to not make believers, not just make people who believe and accept you as Savior. No, you would have said that if it was the case. And, and God, that is the most awesome news that we can hear, that somebody has been saved by you and that somebody, somebody has decided to, to put, lay aside their life and follow you. But, but that person is just a child in their faith. I mean, honestly, at some points we all feel like we're children in faith and we just got to learn a little bit. But, but Lord, there are those, those among us right now who are pretty confident in you. And, and Lord, they, they have matured in their faith. And mature in their faith doesn't, doesn't mean age. No, that does, that's not it at all. What it is is that they are mature in your word, that they are seeking you on a daily basis, wondering what you're all about. That's a mature believer. Age is but a number. So Lord, use us. Use us to help the people who are amongst us who need that help about discipleship, who need help reading the word, who need help praying. That's fine. Give them courage to, to come to people who, who are, desire to help them. Give them courage to, to plug into a life group, to learn, learn about your word more, to, to love you more, to, to pray to you more. But Lord, use us mature disciples to help them. And let, let us not become boastful in that. No, because the only thing we're to boast in is you. But instead, Lord, let us be humble, helping them love you more. That's all we care about. Father, be with us as we go from here. Uh, just give us a great afternoon in you. And thank you for this beautiful weather that we could just spend outside with family and friends. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for dying on the cross for us. And God, we just, we just know you're with us. And we pray that you go with us from here. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys are good to leave. <laughs> Have a fun afternoon. I got you guys out of here at 11, so you can give me a handshake or something. <laughs>